Hi, and welcome to the Authentic Audience Podcast. I'm your host, Krista Ritma. This is a marketing podcast like you haven't heard before. It's about real connections and honest conversations. Why am I here? To remind you that you can fly. If you're brave enough to listen to that calling inside you, I'm here to serve you and show you that marketing can and should be honest, that the truth sells and authenticity wins. So how can businesses and brands build a real and authentic audience? The Authentic Audience Podcast gives you insight into growing your business and marketing strategies to gain real followers and loyal customers. Each week, I create a space of radical honesty for thought leaders and entrepreneurs who have built successful businesses to share their insights on business, marketing, relationships, life, and spirituality. Each episode is sure to remind you the power of storytelling and truth selling. Get ready to get real, get raw, get honest, and keep growing. Jean de Kroon is the founder of Zazie. Zazie is an Amsterdam-based fashion label with a focus on sustainability and women's economic and social independence. Working with women's artisanal communities through both the United Nations Ethical Fashion Initiative and independent NGOs, Zazie aims to connect consumers back to craftsmanship and co-creation. Jean is a public speaker on behalf of the European Union, a global ambassador for sustainable fashion, environmental awareness advocate and is changing the perception and importance of artisanal craftsmanship one step at a time. (laughs) Obviously, with that introduction, everyone knows why I'm so excited to welcome you. So thank you for being here. No, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to to join this podcast and thank you for all the incredible stories that you've been facilitating. It's a it's a true honor from oh, life so from my fun. house board in Amsterdam. <laughs> uh, speaking of that, that's where I want to begin. So it's a crazy time and the first question I always start with is how are you? Mm-hmm. Where are you? Tell me what's happening in your world right now. Yeah, okay. So in my world, so I recently moved from Berlin to Amsterdam. Um because my heart really wanted to go back and also really connect to family. Hmm. Um, and this was, and I was just in India to visit some communities when, when Corona happened and I was on the last airplane home back to Amsterdam. And then I didn't really have a place to live. And then all of a sudden there was this houseboat. So I'm living now on a seventies houseboat, um, just outside of Amsterdam. And we're trying to shift offices here, but it's kind of a little, like a little operation, um, so that's sort of just like all the, all the stuff that's been happening on like, on like a personal level, I have never felt so grounded. Mm. And of course, you know, although like it feels like a very anxious time on a lot of levels and there are a lot of like global insecurities, I'm actually really noticing on a personal level that I've been sleeping really good mm. and that I've been having a lot of space, um, for creativity and for, you know, when you have feelings normally you go like, okay, you know, you go away from the feelings. You're just like, oh, I have this feeling, but then you go to play and to things and you meet people and you sort of never really have the chance to really like feel into them and breathe into them and to have that you know space and time for it so I'm doing really well and I'm really mm. excited to um to see if this new crazy time can be a, a fertile space for um for new awareness for new global awareness on how we relate to the world oh, I think that's a really beautiful and positive way of looking at everything I just recorded a solo podcast that came out yesterday because I didn't get my my life together in time to put out a real podcast. And it's been mm-hmm. positive for me too. And I think um, sitting in that is hard when so many people are struggling and suffering to be in a place yeah. of sleeping well and slowing down and actually thriving um, mm-hmm. in this new place. It's um it's interesting. And, and I appreciate your honesty around that. And I've been following you, of course, and I'm so excited about your new life on the houseboat. And it just seems very on brand for you and like, couldn't be more perfect. So mm-hmm. congratulations. I'm excited for that life on the water. Thank There's you. like nothing better, you know? So yeah, it's such a gift. And I mean, like, yeah, I think, I mean, it is definitely what you're saying as well. You know, it is such a privilege, especially, you know, working with the communities now. I'm so aware even more of my privilege being here and not being in India where they're, you know, they're going through so many stages of insecurity and of food shortages and of, of economic uncertainties. And I think, you know, I think yeah, them being in a place like this just really makes you aware like, wow, okay. Um, um, yeah, really happy. Yeah. So I want to talk about Zazie. Um, I, my friends and I, I heard 
of you through Emery, who's my best friend. And I know you guys have communicated before on Mm -hmm. um, Instagram and, and we go to Nepal together and um, I help her do a lot of her work over there in Nepal. And she showed me her Instagram and I have to say to start, I have like zero fashion sense. I don't know very much about Mm -hmm. fashion, but Emery and Shay, my two friends um, that just worship you, we all have like the biggest girl crush on you and what you do and who you are in the world. And for me, obviously what you're doing goes so beyond just having Mm -hmm. a fashion sense, right? So um, once I started following you and reading your words, I just couldn't really get enough. So I would love you to just tell my audience who may not Mm -hmm. know you, who you are and, and what is Zazi and what, what's your purpose and mission with it? It just takes such a long story, but okay. Um, so, that we have time. Yeah. That's why you're here yeah, to listen to time. your story. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so I grew up originally in Holland, in The Hague, and I grew up with a mother that um, she used to be a, a fashion journalist and turn an art historian. Wow. And she would like come back with textiles from all over the world. And I think she was really just like a, she was a, she was a fashion journalist, but like one that would like hyper specifically go into like one natural dye. And my dad um, was, um, was a documentary maker about the magic of 17th century light in Holland. So like, I really grew up with like two parents that were just like too excited about reality. You know, they were just like, they could look for like two hours at this like one little blob, how like the water went up and down. And wow. I mean, I'm here in my houseboat and like seeing the reflection of my light. Of, and I just know that my dad could look, stare at this for ages. So I think there was always this like really beautiful way of like perceiving, perceiving the world and perceiving what is around you and trying to find a way how to connect to that. So um, but then, of course, I also grew up being, you know, in a Western society um, and see, looking at fashion and then also being like really conditioned. So where my mom would give me a sewing machine when I was 14 and say like, OK, here's a thrift shop, like, like good luck with your outfits. Um, I was also seeing this fashion world that looked full of glamour and glitter. So it was a really dual way of trying to figure mm-hmm. out like, OK, so what does it really mean for me? Um, and then um just out of high school I I moved to Paris and I became a street musician and when I was in Paris I got scouted as a model and of course when you're you know like a young girl and you're 18 um, when you're scouted as a model it's sort of just like a very exciting thing because that's what you've been conditioned to sort of believe is like a great confirmation of your womanhood or of your being um so yeah like two weeks later I went to New York and it was at the time of fashion week Mm. and I I mean, I got into like, you know, the typical like model scheme. I was big with a big agency, but I was there without a working visa and a bunk bed. And like, you know, two days later, I had to lie at customs. And like two days later, I was there um, on some sort of like web shop shoot, photo shoot. Um, and uh, I remember standing there in his polyester dress with like way too much makeup on, like full of insecurities. And I was just like, excuse me like like what am I selling and like what is this fashion world that I always so you know glamorized um and I think there was just this really inherent feeling of just like really not being satisfied with it and I uh I took a I took I went from New York then to Berlin um just like a two months later because it made me very unhappy to be there in New York as a model a very unsuccessful model but as a model um And then in Berlin, I think I went through so many stages where I was really trying to figure out like, okay, how do I navigate this world? And what's, what is my purpose? And what is my destiny? You know, just like, I think everybody always is and still finding and trying. And then I applied for uni and then on my, on my final job, when I was, um, when I was still modeling in in Germany, I got booked exactly one time and that never happened really. Because it was, um, it was like my German agency called me and they were like, oh dear, we have one job. We cannot believe it, but like, let's go. Yeah. So I went over, so I went over to, um, and to do the job and then, yeah. And then the, the stylist gave me like this t-shirt and it was from like a big fast fashion retailer, but she sort of gave it to me like, oh God, you know, I think you, you can, you can use like an extra t-shirt because I was going through like a really big hippie phase. So I was in, I was, I was traveling a lot in Nepal and I had this, you know, beautiful boyfriend with dreadlocks and he would write poetry on the street and I would walk about food through Berlin. And, you know, we, we were both really searching for just like, okay, what is, you know, how can we relate to the world? Um, so she gave me this t-shirt and then a little while later I booked my yoga teacher training uh, in mm-hmm. India and then when I was traveling there alone I at some point 
there was this woman that grabbed my hand and she, I was wearing this t-shirt or I got on the job and she was looking at me and she was like, I really want to show you this thing. So a little while later, I was in the south of India. Um, I mean, there is this like the, a lot of subcontractors from like major fast fashion retailers. They all produce there. So when I was finding myself in my in the slum area, brought by this woman that I met on the street, and she was like, "I really want to show you this thing," and I was like, "Oh, okay, interesting." So we went to visit this incredibly really beautiful woman that lived next to this really heavily polluted river that was like bubbling with pink bubbles Mm. and um she she told me a little bit of her story I couldn't really understand that much and we're drinking chai there and I was really enjoying the moment I was like wow I'm like surrounded by all of this but why exactly and then at some point I saw a really big bag of diapers in the corner of the room and then at some point there was um I asked the woman that brought me there, like, can I facilitate? Can I, you know, like, what is happening? Or is she okay? Um, and then she said, like, well, the reason why I took you there is because the, the T-shirt that you're wearing is is most likely made in a factory where she's working and she cannot use the bathroom because she gets locked up for 14 hours per day. Um, and I think that was the first moment where, you know, when you cannot identify with 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 something, that means the woman that is behind your shirt or, you know, like the Mm -hmm. animals in the animal agricultural industry or like a pig or whatever you cannot, when there's no identification process, there is no empathy. And when there is no empathy, there's no change in behavior. And I think this counts for like all major, you know, issues when it comes to climate change, but also when it comes to, you know, ethical consumerism on a lot of levels. Sorry, I hope this thing is not too. Oh, that's better. Um, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there good. You go. We're better. We're oh, better. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Maybe I'll just keep it like this. Um, <laughs> you have so um, many like jewels and and I know I'm like covered in feathers and bangles <laughs> and things. So it's kind of. I like, wish my sorry. audience could like see what I'm looking at. <laughs> it's like a lot of action. Yeah. So beautiful. Um, yeah, but I think that was for me a really big change. And I was like, wow, okay, you know, like you have been so conditioned in the West to look at fashion as a way of like, you know, supermodels in 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 great outfits. But then actually it has nothing to do with the cloth itself. And then I wow. started to get more into, into, into textiles. And I was like, it's really interesting because like a hundred years ago, if you would see a piece of clothing, you could identify where it was from because it was dyed with the natural, you know, elements of nature. I mean, we work now in Afghanistan and you, you know, you make cloth with like, you know, the waste of the saffron, um, like local farmers. And you make cloth with like, you know, the local pomegranates or the walnuts or the onion dyes. So like fashion is, I mean, inherently it's a way how women and translated their world through cloth with the local nature like that's literally what it always used to be and this this you know it was incredible because when you looked at you know old craftsmanship you could really identify and like get lost in these dreamy stories of like okay you know this elder from this one particular village she, she used to make this you know one cross stitch with like a special you know natural dye that only she knew of and at some point we we started to shift our gaze from the actual beautiful stories, which is, you know, like how women have explained their world um, to this sort of like weird made up like fantasy world and like fashion circus that we look at now. And I think, I mean, you know, probably notice as well, you know, when you travel anywhere in the world, you can always connect to women through cloth or through like babies. Like these are like the ma- major two connection points. That is points. so like when- real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. It's either just like, oh, like cute top or it's like, oh, nice baby, you know? Like, Especially like- <laughs> when you don't speak the language. Exactly. And food. I mean, food is definitely also a really right. important That's, one. So I, I feel like when we went to Nepal, um, I can relate to that because I'm like looking at this rug right now and it's a Dolpa rug and you can only get it from a certain place in the Himalayas and it's these women that make it and it's this whole story yeah. behind it. And that was one of my yeah. questions for you was about um, how do you preserve culture through clothing and you're sort of answering it right now yeah it's this and this is the most important thing and I think I really believe I mean that's just a complete sidetrack from where we started but um (laughs) I think you know like that's the magic of textiles and I think having been traveling now for the last few years and knowing and seeing like how, you know, like women from the high peaks of Tachikistan to, you know, the mountains of Nepal to like the deep Amazon have used like the same drop spindle technique, but also mm. like all have their incredible, beautiful stories about the cloth behind it. Like I was in, in, um, in, um, 
um, Brazil last year and it was with the Huniquin, which is like a local indigenous tribe. And they have these amazing stories of like how every piece of cloth is linked to the spider goddess because the spider goddess oh. like appeared in a vision of the ancestors and it's the little spider that lives inside of the cotton plant. So this spider, you know, still, they still sing, sing the song of the spider goddess when they weave, you know, the sacred patterns. And I think it's such a, like, there are so many beautiful links um, to nature, to beliefs, to like a spiritual connection to your cloth. Um, so for me, this is fashion. And I, for me, this is always, you know, like when I started to come on this journey, I was like, okay, this is fashion. So I started collecting and collecting and collecting. And like my boyfriend, uh, always used to call me like fling fling because like every time I walked around there were just like too many things like fling flinging and like bangling and <laughs> twiddling and like doing and <laughs> yeah it was just so um at that point it was really interesting because I think at some point I was like okay so I want to bring this to people but also realistically like I am on a student budget like I got student money at the time from the Dutch government and I heard it from Mary Americans this is like mind-blowing but like university here is a bit different so but on a very limited you know student budget so I uh, was also like okay I have a lot of ideals but I don't have capital I don't have a business plan I like how do I start so I think quite naturally at that point it was like I just started on the Sunday markets and I started explaining mm. everybody that wanted to hear these stories behind cloth I remember standing there and I got, at some point I got to know multiple families and it's really interesting because, you know, once you have the intention of like a certain path, just things appear on your path. You're just like, hello, excuse me. How did you get there? And like, how did you get my number? And like, how did, how did this all just happen? Um, I love that. Yeah. Well, and you know that you're on the right path. Like for me, those signs, I've just, I'm having a similar experience right now to like, Mm -hmm. what's happening? Like, I didn't even really ask for this, but at the same time, this is what I set my intention to. And then it just comes. Totally. And I learned that with yoga, actually, when I did my yoga teacher training, um, when you Mm -hmm. just, when you dedicate your life to like this greater purpose, whatever it is, the doors start Mm -hmm. opening because it's like not about you. (laughs) Totally. And I think that's really the big thing when I, cause I really remember very consciously that I really set this intention. Like I want to serve this thing that I learned about textiles. Like I want to serve this to the world and to as many people as possible. And I don't really care in which format this has to go. Like I never thought about having a fashion company. I was just like, I want to, I want to make people see what I see when I look at cloth and when I look at the world and when I look at craftsmanship and when I look at, you know, when I look at textiles, now I see hands, like I can only see hands and I can only see, you know, like I can only see. I'm never going to look at a piece of cloth the same way again. (laughs) Yeah. And it's the most beautiful thing, you know, it's like, it's creation. It's like creation and creativity and like, yeah, it's, so I would just really wanted to serve like the, in a way, like the world or the people around me with this, with this knowledge that I really felt so deeply resonating and I I think I really had this like one ritual I remember it was like on my 23rd birthday yeah it's like four years ago yeah, you're quite um, young by the way yeah I'm young <laughs> yeah I'm to have young. such a successful and um, amazing platform yeah like in its own way it still feels like a really small community but it's a really beautiful community and I feel like it's very powerful um but yeah so I set this intention and I think you know that's like that's a big part of it so I started selling on the Sunday markets and then all of a sudden I got to know all of these textile families and then through that at some point I met my Indian mama which is the most inspiring woman that I know in the whole world called Madhu Vaishnav and she just started her NGO so we sort of like aligned path at, at the right time time at the right place and um then I literally drew a dress on a on a napkin in like a tally restaurant we we're having like a tally together we we're talking about both of our projects and beliefs and she was like oh just make a dress we'll figure it out so she took me to her local sari tailor called Master G and like he like nodded his head a few times up and down and he was like okay I can try to make a pattern so he made a pattern from old Indian newspapers and I called one of the textile families that I that I was already working with for the Sunday markets. And I said, like, yeah, we have this, you know, secondhand ikat from the Fergana region from like the 70s or 80s. So I made seven dresses from, you know, this ikat that I found through them in this small village with the women that she was working with. And, um, you know, one sleeve was like 20 centimeters longer than the right. other. And it was all just like, you know, just like, but so much excitement because we co-created this dress together, you know, it was really like, 
I mean, there is incredible craftsmanship in India. And I think these women were just, you know, they're, they were sort of reviving the local craft in that village. Um, and then together, I just remember sitting there for hours in like 45, 50 Celsius desert. Yeah. I don't know what the Fahrenheit is, but it was very hot. It's hot. <laughs> and, yeah, hot. <laughs> just hot. <laughs> and then I just remember sitting there being surrounded by, you know, just creating together. And I think learning about textiles together. And then I came back to Germany and then this started into my company called Zazi as it is sort of now. And then, I mean, a little further down the line now, we work with the most incredible artisanal communities, both through the UN and independent artisanal families and NGOs in uh, Uzbekistan and Afghanistan and Tajikistan and in India and then hopefully in Ghana soon. So wow. I really just want to like, my favorite thing in the world is trying to make people excited about what I feel really excited about and I feel like that's sort of what I can do really well now with Zazi so it's it's been a yeah the biggest gift of my life to have found this sort of like interwoven thread that connects all my elements together I love that story and it's so beautiful and I I don't know how much you know about me but I have a marketing agency so I I market people that I am excited Yay! that I'm excited by and <clears throat> so it's really hard for me to like take off my marketing hat. So sitting here <laughs> listening to you speak, it's like, oh my gosh, this makes complete sense about why it works, right? Because yeah. one, first and foremost, authenticity always wins. And so when you yeah. have something that has a purpose and that you're really excited to scream and share from the rooftops mm -hmm. every day and like champion mm -hmm. this thing, it's like going to be so exciting for everyone else because hearing the way you talk about cloth and hearing the way you talk about culture and design and fashion gets other people excited because you're so excited mm -hmm. about it and you can share it in this way. Also, it's really specific, like this textile, this like niche thing. It's not this huge sort of, mm -hmm. um, un, like, I can't think of the word, but it's, it's, it's niche enough that you can actually make a really big difference in this particular area. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, it's big, it's niche enough that it's specific and it's big enough that people are going to be really interested in it. And, oh, and nice. I like and, your marketing. I yeah. Like your marketing and thoughts. the product <laughs> is the product itself is beautiful. So if you haven't seen these, the coats are what I'm obsessed with. And I actually, my friend and I, Shay want to want to get one for Emery, um, for her birthday, Aww. because she's just so obsessed with what you're doing. And, and, um, I've just been, you know, enamored by, by everything you post and, and by the fashion that you share. But to me, it's like, not only is this really beautiful what you've done, but it makes sense from a business standpoint why it works. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and I guess that's so. Exciting. I never, yeah, <laughs> I, never, I never, I never thought about it. You know, I never thought like, oh, I'm gonna have a fashion business. You know, it was kind of like it's like accidental. It's like, oh, this is I really love doing this, and then people started asking me like, oh, I want to buy this from you, and I was like, oh, it's okay. But nice. that's why it works. That's why it works. And it, like, that, totally, it, you can't fake that. You can't fake that no. intention. And to, intention to me and my listeners know this is everything. And yeah. when your intention behind something is that pure, is that organic, is that just yeah like purposeful, then the abundance comes and the doors open and the, the networking and the, you know, everyone wants to be a part of it. It just happens, happens, happens. It's you can really feel it. Yeah. You can feel it. Yeah. And I think, you know, like this is, yeah, I, yeah, I've just, yeah, I'm really happy that this happened. This is really, I really feel like this is my thing. And then the really funny thing is as well is that when I came back from the Amazon, because when I was in the, with the Huni Coins, I kept on having visions of a spider and I was like, well, excuse me, but like, I'm kind of done with the spider now. <laughs> like, it's not my favorite thing in the world. And then it, I found out later the whole story about Bashnam Pudu, which is kind of like the spider goddess of the weaving and of the women. And then I came back to Holland and then my dad was like, oh, you didn't know where our family came from? And I was like, no, I thought we were potato farmers. And then he was like, well, no, we us actually like the croon is like a part of a 17th century weaving machine. No. So I come from this. Yeah, it's literally my, it's literally, it's literally my in <laughs> your ancestral. That's incredible. Um, I have so many questions for you, but my next question is about how it's being perceived because you were recently featured in Vogue and you're quite a disruptor and you're not quiet. You're not quiet about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're definitely mm -hmm. like, you know, excited and loud about um, this movement. And how has that been received by the fashion industry? Because it feels to me like you're quite a disruptor in, in this industry. And yeah, kind of 
how do people respond to you? <laughs> like, like really mixed. I think it's really interesting because when I was just entering the fashion industry, I remember coming into it because I mean, I just, you know, I was standing on the Sunday markets and I was still walking bare feet in Berlin at this time. So I really, really had no like, you know, intention of setting up as fashion business. And then I remember the first season when I, I, I got connected to this incredible PR agency and they really facilitated for, you know, this, this Zazi in, in Germany at that time. And I remember my first fashion week and I remember like arriving at, you know, cause we were picked as like the Vogue talent of the year. So we had this like little sort of exhibition thing. And I remember feeling so insecure. I was like, Oh my God, because it feels a bit like high school, you know, like yeah. I just remember standing there and I was like, okay, I'm here with like, you know, all of these things, but also just being like, Oh, how will this work in the fashion industry? And I think, you know, at some point I was also just like, okay, I just, this is so much what I believe in and this is not about me and this is not about like my fashion designer dreams or something like this. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, like do it for the, for the thing. And I think that's, that's what always pulled me through whenever also a collection didn't work or whenever something didn't work out. It was really this, like, I'm not doing this for myself. I'm really doing this because I really believe in this mission. I really believe that I can, you know, that I have a role in this change to play. Um, and then I think fashion really reacted and that was the that was the really surprising thing you know like I think every time when I've been trying to adapt to the fashion world I my I, my company lost in some way like I remember you mm. know when I was just getting into the first sort of like Zazi hype in Germany, I was like, okay, so I also have to dress a bit more, you know, like the fashion girls. And I, I have to go to the parties where they go because then, you know, people will see me. And I was really trying to adapt. It was just like, oh, it's not really me, but like, yeah, let's go. And then I think it was really interesting because it was kind of like the universe was like, uh-uh, Jan, you know, you're yourself. Like if that means you eat vegetables and do yoga at home, like people will notice you and they will come and they will come on your path and then they're the right kind of people. So I think, Every time when I was trying to like sight, you know, go to the side was just like, oh, but maybe I should do this. I think I, I've really learned to really stay so true to myself. And, and that also is super scary, you know, in it terms to, I mean, we've recently made the decision to completely cancel all stores that we work with, which is very scary because, you know, when you don't sell to, let's say, a big online retailer or a big store, that also means you cannot get certain press because they get commissioned. Right. So it's kind of like a whole Why, like, why you know, did you make that decision? Because uh, stores take 70% of the of the margin. Wow. So when I sell to a store, let's say, you know, this was the problem with my coats because I buy them for 300, then I sell them to a store for 600 after German text, nothing is left. Um, okay. And then and then the store, store sells them for 1800, which is which made the coats like, you know, like two and a half K in dollars. And I think this was for me, it was just like, this is actually, it doesn't make sense because it doesn't go to the artisan. It doesn't go to the growth of the thing that I'm trying to set up. It does, it just goes to the, you know, to the system that is broken. And I think whenever you buy a brand in a store, that means, you know, the store gets 70% of the cut. And that is because there is a, a global amount of 30% supply chain waste, which means that 30% of global fashion goes to waste every single year. Uh, I mean, this is sort of, you know, I can talk in like the billions of tons that it's, you know, like that it sort of is, but it it comes down to um, you are carrying that weight as a consumer. And I think this is quite a technical story, but it, it just comes down to it's not fair to anybody. And it's like, you know, fashion is this really complicated system of a lot of economic dependencies. And I think when you're a small brand, it's really scary because you have to um, navigate having a brand from a financial point of view so you have to invest everything and then hopefully you know you sell it and this was uh, very different and when you work with stores they partly buy it so you have security so it means letting go of a lot of insecure of, of security and saying like okay i'm going to invest and just hope that people will will connect yeah. to it in that way yeah. and i hope it's that like you know press art, art solopreneurship all of these things coming into play. It's totally. It's kind of, but it's the same, like, you know, putting out music without a label. Yeah, it's exactly the same, like, it's, you know, you can really put it into every single creative thing. It's kind of like, okay, it's more me. I can hold my complete, you know, creative there. And if, if the magazines will write about me, that's okay. And if they won't, then that's also okay. And I think it's like a they have, and that's the really, and you know, that's an amazing thing. Like some, all of these moments where you're, where you're sort of like really doubtful and you're just like, oh my God, will this work? I feel like every time I've made a decision like this, the universe is always just like, okay, good job. <laughs> you know, you chose totally. the right option. Well, you go to the next I, level. That's what I mean by authenticity winning, right? For me at business, I really like 
dive in a lot in my mind and just Mm -hmm. in my research to business and what makes business successful. And to me, I have this huge mission of honest business and I, and integrity to me is the biggest thing above all above anything else. And I try and instill that in my team and in my clients and in all the work that I do. And every time, because to stay in integrity means making really hard decisions, (laughs) you know, integrity isn't easy. And so it means sacrificing money. It means sacrificing partnerships. It means sacrificing a lot of things in the name of purpose, in the name of of truth. Of what I believe in. Exactly. And I do find that the universe rewards me almost like too quickly sometimes where I'm like, who's watching me? Like what's happening? Because Because it's so real. And then I think there really is no shortcut in what you just did, you know, removing yourself from the stores. It's such a big risk. And at Mm -hmm. first it might seem really scary, but I think the people who you want to buy from you will see that as a way of wanting to support you even more. Right. So totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's super beautiful. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is I saw this really beautiful post. This was a while ago, but you, you wrote something really beautiful Mm -hmm. and it was sort of how I discovered you. I had known who you were, but then Emery shared this Mm -hmm. post with me and I was like, yes. And Mm -hmm. it's about, um, as somebody, you know, grew up growing up in the Western world, going into Mm -hmm. these developing countries Mm -hmm. and working with these artists, it's this idea of cultural appropriation and exploitation versus, um, Mm -hmm. co-creation and celebration. Do you remember mm-hmm. what post so I'm important. talking about? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if, I feel like I was, yeah, I bet this is such a big topic in my yeah, life. And I, I was think, hoping you, know, you could just talk to that and, and what you mean by that and, and how yeah. to navigate that, that world. Yeah, super hard. And I think, you know, I'm still learning about this every single day. And I think, of course, you know, like I grew up in Holland. I grew up in a former colony. I am born in a white body. I grew up as in like, you know, as like a legacy from a from an oppressor. I mean, I'm not a man, but I'm a woman from this country. But still, there are so many, so many like, you know, post-colonial pain all over the world. And I think the more I've traveled, the more I've been, you know, in, interacting with this, you know, from the deep Amazon, you know, with the missionaries to the, you know, like to the African countries, to uh to india and everywhere and i think this is such an important thing to be aware of you know you cannot just come in and say like okay first of all i think it's the narrative which is really important like i think i never i never set an intention where i was never like oh i'm going to help the women there and i think that's a really wrong perception of the western world because you know when you grew like we grew up with a single story and at least in holland i don't know how it was in america but in holland it's very much you know like you know, Columbus to conqueror and like, you know, great white man on big boats. And like, you know, this is all of the great things that we're proud of were all done by man. It's also really interesting to see that 0.5% of global history is made by women that we record it. Um, so there is this really deep conditioning. And I think once I knew about the other side of the story and once I was really just opening my eyes, I was, I was like, excuse me, like how, how limited did I grow up? And like, there are these incredible craftsmanship. And like, when I think of Ghana, I think of like the richness of, of Kenta fabric. And I think of, you know, just like the incredible, the incredible stories and, and cultural elements that are behind it. And I mean, my boyfriend is half Nigerian. So he tells me about like his deep, profound, you know, like, the the Igbo culture that he comes from in Nigeria, you know, they have this incredible alphabet that sort of like links to every single element of life that can also be found. Then you know, like similar ideas can be found in all kinds of you know indigenous cultures. And they, I really believe that this is the time where we really have to listen to the stories that we've not been listened to because I think mm. these you know stories until the uh, you know the most important components on how to move forward as a global as a global culture. Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to appropriation, I think it's really important to discuss. I think for me, I really feel that Sazi is a, a complete co-creation. Like we co-create with the artisans and it would be really weird when I would say I'm making a sustainable textile in India and it would be like a white organic cotton t-shirt because then you're negating the complete, you know, richness of their culture. Like it would make so much more sense to be like, okay, I would love to work with you. You've been obviously knowing this tradition, this craft, this art, this, you know, 
beauty for generations. Like, how can we create something together? And I think that's really what I feel like I do with Zazi, where we, yeah. you know, we work with it with a with a workshop in Uzbekistan, and I'm just like, oh my god, Gulzona, for example, who weaves the, the cotton and the 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 ikat um, on her loom has to take 37 steps before it's woven. She has to, you know, like on a day she can only like. I just I just feel it, and we t- we talk to them every single day. They're like the family, you know. They're just like. Right. And I think having this really respectful way of just trying to navigate these things and I think re um being aware, I think that that's really important of where it starts, like being aware yeah. of your privilege and being aware of like, you know, the colonial history, being aware of the pain, being aware of, but then also being like, how can I use this privilege to facilitate, you know, this incredible craft and this incredible uh, culture that I, that I got to know and that I think the whole world should know. And how can I, I mean, I think there is a big reason why I'm not never on the Zazi Instagram. Like Zazi really feels like there, it is, the place where Gulzona from Uzbekistan or where like Amadou from India connects to the consumer. Like the brand. It's so beautiful. And I did notice that I'm just taking notes on what you're saying because I don't want to (laughs) forget. I'm, I'm fully here. Um, but I love that because I did notice that on Zazi and you are like a model of course. So it would be so easy for you to put your face on the clothing and put your face on the Instagram Mm -hmm. and on the brand. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's Mm -hmm. a really beautiful decision that you made because to me, people follow people and then they follow brands. So actually to Mm -hmm. remove your face from the brand and feature Mm -hmm. these women is an amazing decision. And I think just speaks to the authenticity of what you're doing. And it is such a fine line. And I'm sure, and that's my next question because I go into Nepal with Emery Mm -hmm. and um, this is my only sort of even little Mm -hmm. small window into what you do is Mm -hmm. my, my journeys in Nepal and working with the women there. Mm -hmm. And um, Emery has been going for 10 years. She speaks the language fully. Oh, that's amazing. I didn't know that. When I go to Nepal with her, it's like (laughs) when we hike through the Himalayas, I'm like with a Nepali. Like she, we always say she's Nepali in her heart. Um, because this whole side of her comes out and it's totally crazy. I really want to come with you to Nepal. Nepal is like such a, like one of my favorite places in the whole world. This I literally amazing. was sitting here having a moment while you were talking, seeing <laughs> the three of us sitting on a floor somewhere. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was a mud Ooh. floor. Um, but when I go, um, and Emery is so, so she takes photographs and she, you know, works with artisans there and just does so much beautiful work and gets so much hate and like backlash and, you know, leave those kids alone and da 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 like just these mm-hmm. really, really rude comments. And so it's like, even mm-hmm. if you are, you know, staying true to the culture and f- focusing on co-creation mm-hmm. and late thinking about privilege and all that stuff, do you still get, you know, negativity about it from people? I, yeah, sometimes like every, um, and I, I get it, you know, I think in the beginning I was learning a lot about it and especially, you know, I learned the most from my boyfriend because I think he's like, you know, he's he's a philosopher and he um, told, did, you know, all of his theses were about, you know, cultural identities and I think, wow. you know, like having this split identity of Nigerian and German and being, you know, perceived as white there and black here, you know, I learned so much of like the, the, the how it feels like, but also this this pain that goes, you know, that is so that is so present within society. And I think this pain is, of course, very easily projected on on anything and anybody that does anything. So I think it is very valid. And I have it sometimes with Zazi where there is somebody that misunderstands it or projects a certain image onto me. And that's okay because you know that pain is there. And I'm always just like Cause it sort of like really hits me in the beginning. I'm just like, but don't you see my, you know, like, don't you see my intention? And don't you see the fact that literally every, you can trace everything at Zazi. So you, every single product comes with a, you know, transparency passport on where exactly the materials from, how much every single body gets from, from the price. So, you know, where every single part goes to So I'm just like, yeah, but I'm really not, you know, this is really not a, I'm, I'm like, please, like, please see this whole thing. But I think, you know, it's so valid. So I think it's, uh, because there's, you know, there is so much pain in the world. So I think that's just, you know, when you when you carry through a new path, when you're trying to redefine a new, you know, form of co-creation, of respectful co-creation, you're always going to have to face people that, um, yeah, that still that are still projecting the old way onto you, and that's yeah. okay. Yeah, I think that's just like how do it's I deal part, with this? I it's really a part s- of it. Yeah. 
yeah, I send them a really nice message and a voice message. And I'm just like, oh my God, I really feel you. Like so annoying, this whole, you know, not annoying, but like yeah. there's, I completely get you. And I, I wish that I could, you know, be there even more to facilitate your story and to facilitate, um, yeah, to make everybody more aware. But I think when it's really aggressive and I've sometimes had this, or I have to rarely um, now anymore, I think because I move removed myself from Zazie. Right. So you either follow me and then, or you follow Zazie. But I think, um, right. And also the narrative, like I also had to learn a lot about the narrative. So I would never say like, oh, look at, you know, like Zazie saving the world or something. Mm. It's kind of like, oh, look at like the amazing family that Zazie is. Wow. From 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 everybody that's involved. Sorry, long answer, but I hope that that answered. Definitely, your no. I think it's really beautiful, and I think that that's such an important conversation to keep having, especially in the Western world, because yeah. more and more we're going over there, you know, to these amazing, beautiful places, and um, there's the stories of these these rugs, right? And we were trying to figure out how to get them here, and you had to hike. You have to fly to Kathmandu, fly from Kathmandu to a, take a helicopter for three hours somewhere else. And then from there, you have to hike two weeks at least to get to this village up in Dolpa. And then at that point, like there was no way to confirm that the women weaving the rugs were getting the money. Like we were trying to figure out how to get Impossible. cell phones there yeah. so that we could check on them with cell phones. And then somebody, yeah. I mean, it's not easy. And I think no. that... It, you know, not to give the other side of it, but it can be so easy to just mm-hmm. you know, make things and lose the culture and lose the story because it's actually not an easy thing to do. Um, you have no. to really, you have to really want it. And so I'm just so grateful people like you exist and are doing this work in the world. And mm-hmm. what is the most challenging part of it now that you sort of have this, like, where is your break in the flow? Where could things get easier for you? Pretend COVID and like the world shutting down Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't real. (laughs) (laughs) So if everything was just like sort of normal, whatever that means, um, where do you find like the the most challenge in, in what you do? Let me see. Um, Oh God, I've had so many challenges, <laughs> but <take> one. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like so many things. I think, I mean, I think the hardest thing is that it is like every good thing takes time yeah. and fashion or Instagram or having a company sometimes doesn't allow that. So for example, and this goes into every single framework, you know, from like, you know, the quality to the deliveries to, you know, having a beautiful, you know, having, having the, you know, doing it as, as well as possible. But I think, for example, now in Afghanistan, I've been trying to figure out like, how can we really work together? We've been working there with the UN Ethical Fashion Initiative. So, you know, it took half a year to make a natural dye palette, right? you know, from all the natural dyes in the area. Then it takes time because there are no real like, you know, textile industries there. So you have to import the textiles, let's say from Pakistan, but then you can do all the rest there. And then, you know, you have silk threads that are being woven by a small woman's collective in Herat and then trying to figure out how to get all the textiles from Herat to uh, to Kabul and from Mazal Sharif to Kabul, you know, through also a war because there is still war for the last 40 years going on there. Um, and artisans that, you know, risk their life every single day, they go out of their homes. I mean, everybody in, 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 in Afghanistan. And then I think trying to navigate all of these worlds together and also trying to build up, you know, the most beautiful supply chain where you can in the end say like, oh my God, you know, this dress is a hundred percent made in Afghanistan. Right. I mean, minus the fact that you have don't have the raw fibers there yet, but really building up products and, and supply chains and like human chains that are all, you know, can thrive and can stay true to the local culture and nature and then trying to also make that affordable for the consumer I think maybe that's even the biggest challenge I mean mm-hmm. your challenge is everywhere they everywhere I think that's the, 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 time, the time one though I think is a really big one and I, I actually interviewed yeah. uh, Martin Johnson who lives in Amsterdam or somewhere near there and has a sustainable fashion um, it's called honest luxury that it's called craft a crafted society and yeah. he works with artisans in Italy and yeah. he's telling me about how a lot of these big labels, um, their artisans have to sign all these NDAs where they'll actually never get the credit and all this stuff and nobody knows where it's made and who they're made by. And so he's no doing, he's doing a lot of work in this. And and I was telling him about you and how excited I am to interview you and that, you know, you guys should probably mm-hmm. eventually meet and um just the time that that is not on your side because you're 
competing against like Amazon or Nike that like have these like two day shipping. Right. And we live in a society that just like demands convenience. And, mm-hmm. and I'm one of those people that demands convenience. And so when I started really waking up to this whole idea around fashion, I've had so many people on my podcast mm-hmm. now about around fair trade and where mm-hmm. your clothing is being made and consumerism and how you're shopping. Mm-hmm. And it's really become so obvious to me. You can't close your eyes. You can't go back. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you just have to, it, you have to understand that when you are ordering something, you have to also the value of it goes up, right? Because everyone's Mm -hmm. actually getting paid fairly. And so Mm -hmm. understanding that when you pay more and you're working with people like you, like understanding where that money's going Mm -hmm. and that it might take a month to get to you. It might take eight weeks to get to you. Mm -hmm. It's not going to take two days and just reprogramming. in That 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 super weird way is so important. It's so important. Yeah. And and it's something that, yeah, I, I've just noticed in myself now that it's like, would I rather have this in two days or would I rather have something that's more like what I'm wearing right now is I know where it's made, right? I know exactly where it was made and I bought it from somewhere local and it was Mm -hmm. really expensive and it was worth every penny. And I think just changing the mindset, it's like something bigger Mm -hmm. that needs to happen, um, on the consumer level of just thinking about where we're shopping, how we're getting things, where our money's going to. And I feel it mm-hmm. happening. I feel, especially because I work in marketing, that mm-hmm. people really are beginning to care where their money yes. goes to. There's like a waking up around consciousness that they want to know who's getting their money because people are realizing yeah. that that's energy and it, and the exchange of that is so sacred. So totally. I, feel, I feel optimistic about it. But my last question for you is, is really mm-hmm. around the fashion industry on your side of things because I'm the consumer and you're sort of mm-hmm. on, in on the inside is what is your prayer for the fashion industry? What is the prayer like for people that are getting into fashion, people that are graduating from, you know, the big fashion schools or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. What, what is your hope for sort of like the next decade or so? Like you said, good things. Fashion. Time. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, like when, when I would ask anybody in the whole world, like, what is your favorite piece in your wardrobe? It is always like, you know, that one piece you had your first kiss with or the one that you got from your grandma or, you know, like everybody has this incredible story with their favorite piece in their whole wardrobe. Um, and I think what fashion, fashion is, is nothing more than like facilitators of stories through cloth. Like we're storytellers, we're creators. And I think the thing is that what I've also noticed is that you cannot connect to a story if it's not real. And this is a really big thing because you cannot connect to a piece of cloth through like a supermodel and Photoshop. If you understand, if you connect to a piece of cloth or if you can connect to the real story behind it, that immediately gives you a responsibility of making it sacred. And when you make things sacred or special, or when you, you know, connect to, to every single level of it in its true being, um, you make it sustainable. And this is, you know, this is the this is the foundation I think of or connection to the world, but also what really defines sustainability. Like sustainability has nothing to do with a marketing term or the fact that your t-shirt is organic or the fact that, you know, like some cool brand came out with a sustainable collection, quote unquote. It really has to do with the fact that you're gonna look at this, you know, dress from your mom or, um, you know, little thing on on the shop at the corner, that you're going to cherish this thing for the rest of your life. And I think the responsibility of fashion um, is to facilitate, you know, the real story and make that really beautiful because it is so beautiful. And this is like my favorite thing in the world, you know, like it is so beautiful and it is so powerful. Uh, Like, I love that answer. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. And I, I'm now realizing what about you I love so much because uh, it's the storytelling. And so for me, I always try and figure out on a podcast, I'm like, why am I so drawn to this person? Like, what is it about this person? Mm-hmm. Me so mm-hmm. excited. Like you and I had to cancel and reschedule like three times first you, then me, then I had to switch, then you had to switch. And I'm like, <laughs> this will happen and the timing will be perfect and we'll drop in yes. when it's meant to. And I always at the end am trying to answer that question of like, why was I so yeah. like set on speaking to this person? And my whole thing is storytelling and telling the truth. And I think um 
to me, the best form of marketing is just really good storytelling. And so yeah, it makes sense that this is working. It makes sense that it's successful. You're a great um, ambassador of this cause because you're so passionate about it. So when it's like even being in, in college or university, when you had a, a subject that you didn't know if you really cared about, but your teacher was so passionate about it, it made yeah. you excited. <laughs> you were just like, okay, let's go. Yeah, like, like I know. love this. And I Geography, think that's, okay. <laughs> that's yeah, what so. you're doing for this, for this yeah. cause. And something that yeah. you know, I don't really know a lot about. Now I talk to you for an hour and I'm like, how can I learn more? How can I know more? So yeah. um, I'm just really proud of, of all of the work that you're doing and excited to know Ooh. you and, and hope to keep, you know, this connection going because I, I do see I don't, I don't say this often, but there is like, I see us sitting on a floor somewhere. Emery. Me there. too. Yeah. I Me think too. it's we a have mud to floor. Make this work. Yeah. I don't know, yes. but, um, how can people find you? Give me all the calls to actions. Where can we support? How can we yeah. learn more? I think the most important thing is I think to support, I mean, of course I have a fashion brand and it's really quite specific. So the most important thing that I really hope that anybody that has been listening to this, that can just like rediscover cloth or clothing or the world. Um, you know, so connect to your wardrobe again. Mm. I'm just going to open up my friend that's going to pick up my new adopted chickens with me. <laughs> um, so I think when you really want to, um, wait one second. Um, so you, when you really want to, it's just me. Oh, she's so cute. Um, I adopted, Almost sorry. <laughs> I think, you know, like to support, yeah, yeah, the whole story. Um, when you really want to support this cause, I think that has really nothing to do with to buy something or to do something. I think it's to, to really look at your clothing that you're wearing and to really just ask yourself, like, how, how do I connect to this and to hold it into your hands and be like, okay, what are you? You know, like, tell me who you are. And then I think through that, there will be this journey with everybody individually, which might be, you know, like I have a really colorful, crazy wardrobe full of all kinds of these sort of stories. But for you, that might, you know, until, you know, really like simple handwoven, you know, linen from a certain region. Like I think for the most important thing is that is that is this question of like, OK, what is my clothing and how can I make it sacred? I love that. That's a perfect way to end. And if you want to learn more, um, she's Zazie. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm also. (laughs) I'm doing your marketing for you. She's Z A Z I dot vintage on Instagram, Um, and the website is Zazie uh, dash the minus dash sign vintage uh, dot com. And I'm just so grateful to know you. Thank you for your time. Good luck with your chickens. Oh, thank you. It's so beautiful to connect to you. And I cannot wait to really connect to you in real life. And hopefully we can like, we can meet in the mountains of Nepal. Actually, that would be my favorite thing in the whole world. That would be the dream. So let's, let's call that in because it seems like whatever, yes, whatever we call in, it seems to be working for us these days. So I think so too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being thank here to you. my listeners. Thank you so much. And until next time, keep growing. Keep growing.